I'm a giant derivative. Think of that opening as credits or a bibliography of what I know. Obviously, I can't possibly show you every place and person that I learn from, but I hope you get the sense of the tremendous learning network I participate in. I owe those people so much. Collectively, they've been a huge part of my learning journey for the past several years. Because every one of them embraces a culture of sharing, I benefit. I won't pretend that I'm going to share something new and original. That's really hard. And as I scan the mountains of data that I've created over the past six years of posting regularly online in all types of forms, I'm not sure there's anything there that's completely original and mine. I've been blessed to work as part of a larger community of learners, teachers, explorers, and innovators who, in the spirit of sharing, have thrown their ideas onto a giant whiteboard for others to use, critique, and mash up. In the end, it's difficult to claim much ownership, and I'm okay with that. We all seek recognition for our contributions, but the moment we focus on protecting our work, we are in some ways the antithesis of a teacher. We, as David Wiley says, invoke our inner two-year-old and undermine the entire premise upon which education is built, and that is sharing. The first time I read this quote by Ewan, I did agree with it, but I wondered if it might be a bit overstated. I mean, it is the work? That seems a bit strong. You mean our work is to share things online? I've been thinking about that one for a while. After listening to Wiley speak, I now agree. David talks about the obligations of institutions to teach not only the students in the building, but beyond. And if indeed we believe that teaching is sharing, then if there is no sharing, there is no education. Our factory model of education meant that we had to confine learning to a space and a specific audience. As we know, this had its efficiencies and benefits for years. We're all products of this very closed, targeted environment. We didn't think of it as closed at the time because we didn't know anything else. We're now in the very early stages of a sharing revolution, and that sharing includes everything from your immediate presence, your location, your photos, your thoughts, your videos, your reading lists, and more. For some, it's too much, and for others, they can't get enough. In this early stage, we've witnessed some important success that have proven the test of time. Social bookmarking, for example, has been around for over a decade. I remember using a service called I Keep Bookmarks back in the early 2000s, which is still around in fact. Social bookmarking as an educational sharing tool might be the most prevalent and easiest entry into the sharing culture. It's a pretty easy sell. You get to peek into the virtual bookshelves of anyone willing to share and use whatever you wish. It's a great system, very unobtrusive and anonymous. You're not required to invest or share any more than you have to. It's educational voyeurism that everyone feels comfortable with. But the moment you begin to ask about the people behind these shared resources and favorites, you move away from safe into some vulnerability. All kinds of questions and concerns emerge as you venture into this world of sharing. Is it safe? Why would I do this? Is it worth my time? 
How do I make it valuable and meaningful? And while these are all important questions, I want to focus on something else. I want to talk a little bit about, is this an obligation? Does my institution see value in this? And how will it help my students? Before the internet, we never really considered an obligation to share beyond our buildings. I mean, how could we even do that? Maybe, maybe you got invited to present at a staff meeting or a conference, or maybe an old college friend asked you to use some resource you created, but these were rare. It was often the case that the teacher next door had no idea what you did in your classroom, let alone someone from another school. Sharing was hard. Sharing was a luxury. Sharing was only for the students in your room. My experience is that most teachers love to share. Again, if sharing is education, that makes sense that educators love to share. And while there are exceptions, generally teachers are wonderful sharers. The sharing part's not the hard sell. It's the who and the where and the how do I share that not enough have understood. Remember the days when resources were scarce. I've been teaching now for over 20 years and I had a single shelf of material when I began. Outside of a few textbooks for certain subjects, I had to scrounge to find resources for the eight or so curriculum that I was responsible for. I spent hours trying to develop learning activities to meet outcomes and had little energy left to spend on reflection and whether or not it was even effective. Today our problems are more about vetting and filtering information and ideas to find the stuff that's most relevant and useful for our students. Who better to vet and filter information about education than educators? What if we could share with the very best educators in the world? Well, today you can. Dan Meyer is a mathematics teacher from California. He's been teaching less than 10 years, but about four years ago decided a blog might be an interesting thing to begin. Here's what he said. Blogging was the cheapest, most risk-free investment I could have made of my personal time into my job. You start by writing things down that are interesting to you, practices you don't want to forget. And then you start trying new things just so you can blog about them and later picking them apart and dialoguing over them with strangers. Periods of stagnancy in your blogging start to correspond to periods of stagnancy in your teaching. You start to muse on your job when you're in traffic, in line for groceries, that sort of thing. That transformation has been nothing but good for me and it all began on a free Blogspot blog. Dan's done a lot more than simply muse about his job. He's created some outstanding math resources that he shared for free. These resources could easily be packaged and published by large companies and sold to educators for significant dollars. One such resource was a video series called Graphing Stories. This was in my third year of teaching and I was really unhappy with the, a particular transition between math topics, um, the transition to um, graphing from single variables. And I, I got this idea and I spent, I, I recall, about 18 hours on a weekend. So a total of 48 hours, 18 of those were spent either filming this, the, the, the raw materials for this, this lesson or editing them on my computer or putting them into, into a format that I could use in classroom. It was just a, a long lesson. And I mentioned it on my blog that I had done this and a lot of people said, look, this is a recipe for burnout to spend that much time on one lesson. Um, instinctively, I thought to myself, well, look, I can reuse this every year hereafter if it's good. Um, and it, it, it was very effective for my goals. And, and then to give credit to their, their concerns, um, I put it online the day after in a format that could be downloaded by anybody anywhere. Um, I put it, uh, a DVD disc image so you could download this image and create a physical DVD that I used in class that had the, the, the generic handouts on it, some instructions for using it. Um, yeah, I just put it up there, just like that. I figured that the more people used it, the more, uh, the less cost those 18 hours were to me. So I was really interested in, in a lot of people getting whatever use out of it they could. So if someone, I offered people, uh, I would mail them the DVD, uh, the first 30 people who posted about it on their blog, 
So that got some traffic coming my way. And um, eventually, at the end of two weeks, um, I checked my stats and 6,000 people had downloaded the disk image uh, in those two weeks. So in an instant, my 18-hour time cost felt like nothing to me. It was much more worthwhile. I asked Dan if he had anyone who could speak to using his resources in his classroom. I found an educator in Scotland. His name is Chris Smith. Here's what he had to say about using Dan's stories. I write a weekly maths newsletter, uh, primarily for the staff in uh, my department, uh, just to, to share ideas that we've got for lessons, um, to tell them a wee bit about useful websites that they might want to look at, uh, to, to enhance the learning in their, in their classrooms. Um, and on, in my quest to fill this newsletter every week, I have to find uh, constantly new material. And I came across Dan's uh, blog and just loads of, loads of really fresh, innovative ideas and all freely available. So I, I was over the moon because I, I was able to, to, to share that in, in my newsletter and then try out some of the lessons for myself with classes. And rather than look at something which should be uh, living should be animated, should be active. Uh, instead of doing that through the textbooks, which were dull and the examples were pretty uh, contrived, this was an opportunity for them to to play around with some maths, with real life uh, scenarios, uh, which instantly grabbed their attention and actually, I believe, made a lot more sense to them. And something that I would have spent. Uh, four periods on, four hours of, of, uh, of work, um, I'm, I think the, 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 my, my students are a better understanding uh, within uh, just over one hour uh, using the, this, this wee idea for a lesson that Dan had created and shared. Every single day, you are the beneficiary of sharing. Whether it's a published textbook, a district-created resource, a book you read, or as often as the case today, something you found online. Does your district have any idea how much you save them by using these freely available resources and ideas? Your students' lives and education are so much richer by having access to people like Dan and countless others because they've embraced a culture of sharing. Are we willing to share even a little bit of what we have and know? Now, we're not all having to share in the same fashion of a Dan Meyer. And as he said, the benefits of one lucid comment or idea can be golden to someone. Your experience, your insights are worth sharing cost you nothing but your time and the return on investment can be exponential. Recently George Kouros, a principal at an elementary school in Alberta, shared a project he had done at his school called the Identity Fair. And unlike Dan who spent countless hours developing a very polished resource, George simply as part of his day in excitement over what was happening in his school shared bits of a very simple idea that had some pretty significant outcomes. We're one of the things that was happening in the school is I just kind of got this idea that as we had this event called Identity, the Identity Fair, Identity Day, whatever you want to call it, where the kids brought this, um, they brought a display, kind of like a science fair concept, but it was about themselves and about what they're passionate about. I just went around, took my Blackberry, and I took pictures of the topics, and so I put the tag Identity Fair so I could actually go back and look at the information later. So I just made it easier for myself. And then if people wanted to look, then I had this resource that I was creating for them. Because we had a girl that um, has Tourette syndrome and that was her identity fair display where she had, she talked about Tourette syndrome so that she could explain it so everyone would understand part of who she was. And it was like, an, like even talking about it, Anytime I talk about it, I get teary-eyed immediately because it was such a moving thing. It was something she was so passionate about. So then I wrote about her first and a lot of people were writing her comments because I shared that with her and her mom. And so she actually wrote back on my blog. So she used that as a form. And then that was, my blog post was used um, by the National, like the Canadian Tourette Syndrome Society or something like that. So they used that. As, as something that they featured on their Facebook page. And so they, uh, they made this connection with this national society. And then I wrote about the process of the day and kind of what we did. And so we got a lot of comments about it. 
So they actually set that up in Texas. So we're in Stony Plain, Alberta, which is like a small town just outside of Edmonton. And she's somewhere in Texas with her school. And she decided that that was going to be what their school did as their opening activity. Uh, before we walked into school, she had sent me an email or she actually sent me a message said, we just did this. Thank you. It was amazing. So I took that email and I, I posted a blog about it and wrote about it and how it is, in my opinion too, is that we, we do share these good practices because I've been at six schools and or five or six schools and no matter what, I always love the kids. And I'll find that if I go to 10 more schools, I always love the kids. And if we're real advocates for education, we wanna make sure we're sharing our best practices with other people and open to them modifying them. And so when she did that, she did, she put her own little spin. It wasn't exactly like our day, but we, it was amazing that we, it was inspired by us. And then I showed her staff, like, this is something that we did that everyone got to see. And it wasn't my idea. And that was, it wasn't about sharing something amazing that I had done. It was sharing something that amazing that was inspired that my staff had done and our kids all took part in. It was just, I was just the messenger of information. So she shared that and then, so I shared it first day with my staff and then the first day with kids, we had an assembly and I talked to them about how they inspired uh, another school in Texas and they were just amazing. Like, this was something that they wouldn't even imagine. And honestly, I wouldn't have imagined a year ago, but now it's like, we're seeing these opportunities more and more in our kids. And now we're having a chance to connect where is real point we are planning to uh, do a Skype conversation during an assembly with that other school so that we can informally have our kids meet each other, you know, and kind of like say like that we connected in that way. And today the buzzwords of professional learning communities or PLCs is a concept that many schools embrace but few experience its true potential. Time, money and geography are the limitations. In the vast majority of these models, those three constraints are significant barriers to sharing and learning together. Your students are direct beneficiaries of the work of others. The difference today is that these, face, these aren't faceless resources, but real people you can talk to, get real-time feedback with, and build relationships with. It's like having the author of your textbook sitting in the back of your classroom, ready to answer, debate, and clarify your questions and ideas. That in itself changes education. At the district level, I've seen glimpses of, new, of sharing in new ways. Being from a relatively small school district, we simply don't have the capacity and expertise in all, in all areas, but recognize that neighboring districts often have resources and expertise that would be useful for our work and our students. Recently, we've been exploring ways to share these resources and people, and since we're all using a common curriculum, it seems to make sense. But why does it have to stop with the borders of your state or province or even your country? Some of the most interesting and meaningful learning experiences I've had center around learning from educators from other countries. Learning from people you have much in common with and those with diverse backgrounds and perspectives is absolutely critical in providing a rich educational experience. Here's an example of someone from another country and in fact someone not even of school age sharing work and transforming learning for both students in, the, in uh, K-12, as well as pre-service teachers. I started my daughter's blog the day she was born, and so I've been kind of monitoring or documenting. It started off as a way for us to share photographs with family back home, right? Uh, as a way for her grandparents to kind of keep up without having to email pictures, and it was just a place where we can stay connected. And as she's getting older, I'm starting to realize that she can play a big part in documenting the things that she wants to do. I read this book called uh, Last Child in the Woods, and I was living in Doha at the time where there was very little outdoorsy things for us to do. And so I, I read this book, I was really inspired, and so I took her out, and she's starting to become a really adept photographer. Um, you know, she can hold the camera, she can frame it, she can take some pretty nice shots. And so when we got back home, I figured um, I could just put them together in iMovie and have her sort of narrate 
um, the, the interaction we had, which is a very simple photo story where I would just told her, okay, you tell me what this picture is and you know why you took it. And it started off, you know, she's only four, so it started off pretty slow, but it turned into this really nice little storytelling, you know, digital storytelling photo story. So I posted it on her blog, um, sent a quick Twitter out, um, and then it kind of went from there. And from the way I pieced it together is that I think William showed it to his class, um, and then they were really interested in it. And so they sent a whole bunch of comments. I think the first day we got like 30 comments a uh, fantastic job, or you're such a good photographer. And I started reading these comments to my daughter, Kaya. And I'm not sure if she really understood what was happening, but she just seemed pretty excited that the people were looking at her pictures. So I sent a, a quick email to William and I said, hey, you know what, these comments are fantastic, but I'm not sure if she could really, is really understanding what's going on. Could you guys do some kind of video comment? Um, and within, I think a day or 24 hours, it was really quick, they did a really fast, um, video comment and so when i showed that to kaya all of a sudden it was much more dynamic her eyes kind of opened up and she really kind of understood that there are some people you know out there that are seeing her work um and then from there i think what happened was that john strange who's a professor in alabama made this story one of his projects so, you know, an assignment for his class. So then suddenly we started getting, you know, I think it's upward of 100 comments at this point. Uh, people in his class who read it and, and just continually, you know, commenting on things like, great job, you're such a young photographer. And, I, you know, I kept reading to him. And then one lady in his class actually had her daughter create a video to Kaya where she reads Brown Bear, Brown Bear. And when we sat and watched that, again, Kaya was just really interested in why this young girl was reading a story and talking to her. And immediately we kind of talked about the idea of, okay, we'll read a, we'll read a story back to her. And we went and got another one, I think, Mama Bear, one of the other Brown Bear series books. And Kaya read the whole thing and I posted it back. So this tiny little act of just, you know, sending a tweet out, say, look what my daughter's done because it's fun and we thought it was interesting affected all these different people's lives. Not only was it William's class, but it was also, you know, a daughter of someone in a class in Alabama. There are literally thousands of stories like this. And one of my Yodas, as Wes Fryer likes to call them, Alan Levine, did an entire presentation on amazing stories of openness in which you'll find even more of these types of stories. You may even have some of your own. And I'd encourage you to share those stories with others and continue to retell them until it resonates with everyone around you. I recently read a quote that said, universities come to know about things through studies, organizations come to know about things through reports, and people come to know about things through stories. I'd be hard pressed to find you any hard data on sharing and I'm not sure that would matter anyways. My point is that sharing has always been part of your job. You are now privy to a mechanism and a structure that enables you to do this better and more broadly. If learning shouldn't be confined to the four walls of your classroom, should teaching? Why would we hoard good teaching and learning? There's something very unethical about that. I believe that good ideas and great work should be shared with as many people as possible. This K-12 online conference has been built around this idea. It's a model of sharing. It consists of great teachers giving time and energy to share, not for money, but because they love to share. And they love students. You do good work too. So do the people around you. Now I hear lots of talk about reform and, and I truly believe that we would see a significant shift to better schools and a better education for our students if more teachers and their institutions understood and participated more fully in a sharing culture. I realize that's not the total solution, but I think it's much more important than we think. Given the technology and our ability to connect, I'm saying sharing and sharing online is no longer an option. So while many of you watching this are doing your part to share, I'm asking you to think deeply about your new obligation to share and whether you're, whether you're a classroom teacher, an administrator or other, you need to be sharing online and sharing regularly. You need to be helping others to do likewise. Not as a cool thing you can do, but because you owe it to others to teach students beyond your classroom and your district. 
It's an ethical responsibility.